بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ویلکم ٹو دی ٹوکنگ دین پوڈ کاسٹ بوٹ ٹو یو بائی دا وائس آف دا امت ٹیم ویلکم یو ٹو آور سیکنڈ ایپیسوڈ ان دس سیریز اینڈ آئی ہوپ دیٹ یو آل انجوائے دا پریویس سیشن اینڈ اگین یور ہوسٹ از ماجد اینڈ مائی کا ہوسٹ ٹو ڈے از برادر راش اینڈ برادر مدثر And today's topic is an interesting one. Uh, it's on the issue of Brunei, which is something which we see in the media quite a lot recently. And it's worth just giving you a bit of background because this issue hasn't just come out of nowhere. In fact, if we look into it, we can see that Sultan Hassan al-Bulkiya, he first formally published the Sharia or Islamic law uh, penal code in October 2013. And at the time, what the government stated was that it was going to implement the law in three phases. The first phase would enact the provisions punishable by fines or imprisonment in April 2014. And the second and third phases would then in- be introduced over the next two years, implementing provisions that included punishments such as amputation, whipping or stirring to death. And we can see that there was... Um, a delay on this because of the outcry international outcry but we see that on december the 29th 2018 brunei's attorney general quietly issued a notification that the law would be enacted in full on april the 3rd so we can see that once this was announced there was an uproar we see that um the hotels that are linked to the sultan are being boycotted which is uh, being led by uh, george clooney and we see uh, many countries leaders of the countries actually speaking out against this now subhanallah if we look at the situation in the west just example in the uk we see that you know uh, there's being laws that are being introduced to do with uh, relationship education sexual education we see this in school and basically um the sort of attitude we have is that if you don't like it then basically you know leave to some stage because there have been many protests people have been saying this is not allowed but we see that you know the general attitude is this is our country and this is our laws so if we think about it that they can say that this is their laws but now you have a country like brunei who wants to establish a uh, sharia law now it sh- you know surely that should be their internal matter why is it that the the world and especially the west can you know um raise up and you know cry about what's going on so the first question that i think is worth asking is that why do you think um there is such an outcry in the west over these laws to the rush inshallah I'll start with you so what i would say is we know that the the west or the powers that be don't eat, can put aside any opportunity to stigmatize and show islam in a bad light so this is quite an easy opportunity for them they see a nation a nation where there's muslims a nation kind of an islamic nation saying we need that they want to implement elements of the sharia and they can quite easily use this to further stigmatize islam to the masses to and actually to muslims and non muslims because as we know that there are some muslims who, which will find this difficult because people who aren't as aware what do you mean difficult so when when they are speaking to other people to actually support this in a public environment right okay yeah when we speak to muslims we recognize and what we will discuss I'm sure today is we recognize most muslims want the implementation of the sharia but the, to put it into the public sphere makes it difficult for people when they're speaking to other people including non muslims and also i would say the reason for it is to isla- to attack these islamic concepts which they talk about being contrary to human rights again is easy for them to do because they've been able to say that human rights is global it should apply to everybody but actually we know that their human rights 
are contradictory in nature themselves. We mm-hmm. just spoke about it, in, like you said, in the previous session, where we said if, if it's a human right to be able to practice your religion and the state not interfere, what are they doing with all of this SRE type of stuff? Yeah. So I would say that if they've used this as an opportunity to further stigmatize Islam. Okay, okay. And actually, just, just on that, what we can see then is that you, you have, like you mentioned, the, the, the issue with human rights. And what we can see is, in fact, what the West are doing here, i.e. through the ideology of capitalism, is they are defining like a universal uh, right and a useful universal wrong based on their belief, uh, which is based on their values. And anyone who is now doing something which disagrees with what they believe, they feel that they can interfere in their business, but not the other way around. But in regards to the the actual penal code itself, what I would add just quickly, yes. but just before you go on to the next part of the question, from what I was just saying is that it's equally clear that by representing some aspects of Islam, they can further stigmatize it. For example, they'll they're highlighting that obviously this is the Sharia laws that they want to implement, but they're not actually highlighting what the Sultan himself said in previous speeches where he said there are lots of conditions Mm -hmm. that need to be met and it's actually quite difficult or in fact very difficult to enact these laws Mm -hmm. because you have to have your four witnesses you have to have all of these preconditions Mm -hmm. but those aspects are not being promoted in the media it's just the the harshness of the punishment that is being portrayed you know one of the the key things uh, you could even call it an elephant in the room about this first question is if you have a look at the the record of the western nations and governments around the world in terms of uh, massacring people changing governments uh, invading lands uh, colonizing areas killing off the indigenous people uh, their, their hands are soaked in blood okay uh, and some of uh, the people of, of the far right, uh, in and of themselves, they will also be of the opinion that there has to be some sort of harsher laws against homosexuals. Maybe it's not identical to, uh, to the Islamic uh, hudu, but they still say that there has to be uh, something against homosexuals because a lot of the you know, extreme far right, they'll disagree with this whole uh, neoliberal agenda about LGBTQ. However, this is what highlights the fact that some of their criticisms, they're not genuine, but they're just based upon uh, an underlying hatred of Islam, which, uh, which has been present uh, within the West since the Crusades, even though they forsook Christianity in terms of it uh, ruling uh, the, the people in terms of their life's affairs where state was separated from religion mm. that hatred for Islam persisted and although it wasn't as apparent uh, prior to 9-11 it, it all came back to the forefront uh, in terms of making it uh, much more apparent to Muslims uh, that the enemy uh, is Islam uh, so when you see that some of these people on the far right that would normally back harsh treatment of uh, uh, homosexuals when they're coming out and they're attacking it there's there's some sort of intellectual inconsistency there so it is just based upon literally just based upon a hatred of islam and i don't think the west is in a moral position to criticize anyone for anything if you have a look at their own record in terms of the massacres that they've been Mm. carrying out more than one billion people have been killed by the wars of the west and secular wars over just the last century, you know, and there's probably many more uh, than that, you know, but it's at least been a billion. So for them to say anything to any anyone else, I really don't think they're in a moral position to oh. to advise any other country of what they should or they shouldn't be doing. Because surely, like I said before, it's an internal issue. Mm. If the people of the country are happy with these laws, mm-hmm. as in what the Sultan said, then... What this actually highlights, and you know, I think for many Muslims who, I think you you won't find many Muslims now who don't clearly see the agenda against Islam, okay? If you did, then I I think it'd be very rare. 
But one thing I think which is now a bit more blatant is the fact that if we actually look at what what they're attacking, these are the rules which come from the Quran and the Sunnah. These are rules that if a Muslim said that they don't exist, would take him out of the fold of Islam because they link to the Aqidah. Okay, so now with that in mind, and you think about it, that these rules would have been implemented, okay, very rarely, but implemented by the greatest of the greatest, the Prophet Muhammad and the companions after. Now, how openly they can criticize these rules uh, and and actually call them barbaric and, and they have no place in today, then in fact, this is like, you know, it's uh, it is obvious for those who see this obviously because in reality, what are these people saying? These people are saying that Islam today has to be reformed because there are core parts of Islam which we just will totally reject. Not even in our in their own countries, but actually they will not even accept them being implemented in the the countries of the Muslims. So you know it's very obvious. It's very obvious. What it does is it aids the agenda. So like you said, you've already clarified, but just to add the other side of it, because the way it aids their agenda is once they promote this kind of in the international media, if you then follow some of the social media side of things, so if you look at a lot of the news groups, a lot of the newspapers, and then the comments below them, when this article was published on a lot of the different stations, you had a lot of people saying things like, and I suspect some were far right, but I suspect they weren't all, they were saying things like, oh, look at the barbaric religions at it again. Oh, this religion needs to, needs to disappear. It's, it's, hit, you know, it's from so many centuries ago. And you got this rhetoric. So it was easy for them to say, look, we'll promote all of this. Don't even need to give it a narrative. But people will make their own narrative because we've been attacking Islam left, right and centre anyway. And at the same time, let, I've just I've printed out something that uh, this was issued by the governor, government of Brunei back in 2014. Okay. So, you know, when you say that, you know, they, they've got no moral ground to stand on, mm -hmm. the, actually, the Sultan himself and I, some of the people gave him, some people have given a lot of credit and actually credit where it's due. Because what he was saying in this, in this statement is, I'll just read a bit of it. It says, again, go back to those worries that you should focus on. I've, that I've mentioned earlier. So he's talking about having, you know, kids being gunned down in the streets, um, prisons being overcrowded, you know, the high rate of crime in these countries, high rates of suicide in these countries, the abortion rates in these countries, Western nations. And he's saying, it is not wrong, is it not wrong to legalize deadly weapons? Is it not wrong to allow unborn babies to be killed? Abortions, is it not wrong to allow lifestyle that results in AIDS and the discontinuation of the next generation? Mm -hmm. You will give someone credit for this because he's highlighting the ills in this society because of their freedoms. Yeah. And what he's saying is, we're Muslims, we want to implement things that will eradicate these. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll have a chat about that shortly, but actually it, do, it shows that it gives them no moral ground because he mm -hmm. goes on to say things like, you didn't care that all of these Muslims are dying in Syria, Bosnia, he mentions Rohingya, he mentions Palestinians, yet you care that even if we implement these laws here, we haven't yet killed anybody, we haven't stoned anybody to death, we haven't put anybody on the death sentence yet, yet you care so much. Mm -hmm. And it's because of their hatred for Islam. I think one of the, the key things that we need to remember is this is something that we have to expect from from the secularists, from the capitalists, from the from, from the kuffar in general, uh, if we never had this reaction, uh, that that would be more sort of confusing. Mm -hmm. Like, why has there not been a reaction? Uh, but but one of the key things that we uh, need to be mindful of is how uh, Muslims are responding to this, because there's a few uh, narratives out there, uh, and. Some of those narratives, although they can appear contrary to each other, both of them are built upon a colonial understanding, uh, fundamentally, of, of the world. And what that can lead to is uh, colonizing the understanding uh, or the mainstream positions of the Muslims. So you've got one party which will say uh, everything goes. You have another party which will say 
this is a positive, any little that we can do is good, but both of them actually overlook uh, the question of uh, what is the reality that Islam has actually uh, commanded. And uh, another point that uh, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to add to that. It slipped my mind actually. So I'll let you guys continue. No problem. Just on that, what, what Rush said as well, and what you said there as well, Mudassar, is that um, what we can see clearly then is that, you know, at the same time, people do speak about um, the, you know, um, colonial attacks or the, the attacks in Iraq and Syria and so forth. But something which is very obvious is that the real battle is the one which is the ideological battle and that's the one that is actually being fought primarily um, and you know even the uh, attacks on the muslim lands and the occupation is to facilitate why because the ultimate goal really is to to change islam is to uh, secularize the muslims is to make islam just purely a personal religion not a deen and in order to do this, what you need to do is you need to attack those aspects of the deen which are political in their nature, which are to do with society, to do with running the affairs of, of the society. And we see that, you know, when the issue is about uh, believing in Allah, when the issue is about people going on Hajj, the issue about people fasting, okay, unless it's in places like China, but generally... There's no problems, you know, absolutely no problems with Muslims doing this. You know, the fact that Muslims flock over to, to Saudi Arabia for the pilgrimage is no problem. But we see that when there is something which is uh, to do with the society and political in its nature, we see that there is an uproar. And that's, some, that's, that's from something as small as a woman wearing the correct Islamic dress to someone who is now... Uh, announcing that he is going to implement the Islamic uh, punishment rules, mm -hmm. the laws in their country. Mm -hmm. So we see that there's a certain element, certain side aspect of Islam that they attack. And then there's another side which actually they don't have a problem with. Mm -hmm. Because from their point of view, they want the Muslims to go through that same sort of like intellectual revolution from their point of view, mm -hmm. which was to detach religion from life. Which is what they did, and that's what they want the Muslims to go through. But but what we are seeing clearly is that there's a huge resistance in this, is because the reality is that if the Muslims were to uh, reject or to denounce certain aspects of Islam, even they know that this would actually take them out of the fall of Islam. Definitely. And Subhanallah, you know. A lot of people sometimes they give they don't give credit to the ummah, but we can subhanallah we can even see that when you get some some scholars, whether we can call them that, when they, when they do promote things like suspending the hudud and and suspending this aspect and that aspect, mm -hmm. it actually exposes them mm -hmm. because even the normal Muslim he knows you know what that's that's wrong, you know and on that point what we need to remember is uh, capital punishment isn't something that's outlawed in the West as a whole. There are countries within the West that allow capital yeah. punishment. The key thing is that there has to be democratic backing. Yeah. There has to be like a majority opinion behind it. Even if it's not domestically, even some of the things that the armies do abroad, they do allow uh, mass incineration and, and you know killing of, of uh, people and massacres. Uh, so if we have a look at various ideologies, uh, in terms of the penal code, a lot of them, uh, if not all of them, in some cases, whether it's treason or whether it's anything else, they will permit capital punishment. Yeah. The only difference is with Islam, it permits it to preserve the lineage because that's one of the makasid of, of the Sharia. But when they do it, they do it to decimate places, yeah. to attack them with chemical weapons. So generations and generations of people are, you know, uh, kids are born that are disabled. Okay. So they do it to cut off the lineage. You know, so this whole idea of uh, uh, them being, uh, the, the West being superior in terms of a civilization, it's uh, an assumption that they sort of, uh, that they, they build their, their own sort of superiority complex mm -hmm. on. 
Does that make sense? So the, 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 the areas that they've conquered and the people that they've killed, they want to hold that viewpoint. But for them, there's still like this moral high ground, there's this superiority. Yeah. And I think your point is uh, really uh, hits home in the sense that uh, it's got to a level now where uh, bit by bit by bit, now it's going for the Jogi the way. You have to reject the Akida. And if you don't reject the Akida, you're going to be criminalized. You're, you're basically going to be put into a corner uh, where even if you believe something else, you're going to be forced to utter things that you don't want to, or ultimately you'll probably be uh, imprisoned. And, and that's what it seems to be leading towards within Europe and the West. I agree. And that's why I think it's also quite convenient that the timeliness of this, I know it, it's been in the media for a while, but quite timeliness is all this whole LGBTQ type movement and everything. All of a sudden, the public opinion that they're trying to create, they mm-hmm. recognise the Islamic stance on this will always conflict. So this coming into mainstream media at the mm-hmm. same time as the prominence of LGBTQ and these type of things also is creating that clash. Mm-hmm. You know, at the beginning they were saying, you know, some Muslims might find this difficult in public. It's just that reason that at this time when even in work and whatever, you're supposed to conform to this view that, okay, I need to accept this or I just need to not say anything about it. When yeah. things are more mainstream in the media, when you're having a discussion with someone, it all of a sudden becomes it becomes a challenge, doesn't it? You have to think, okay, with this non-Muslim person, when I make a comment, I need to think how I'm going to speak to them. I need to clarify to them first, yeah. which of course we should do anyway, yeah. but it just tried to put the Muslim on the back foot and therefore for some people who may not understand as much, maybe you know push them in the but wrong direction. I, I think that goes back to the, the point that I made earlier that what they're doing is they, they are like establishing the 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 truth the universal truth mm. and, and 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 falsehood based on on their understanding right yes. so that's why in fact you look at the irony of it but the uh, Budassa made a fantastic point earlier about look at their track record right mm. just think about how ironic it is is that you know the the one who's covered in blood is asking the one who's not even killed anyone why are you such why, a murderer yeah. for why you are know, you implementing why are you implementing this right yes. because if you think about it why it's why you can have a discussion with a guy over a coffee a non-muslim and he would somehow even though he doesn't know much but he somehow feels himself to be in a position that you have to justify your stance to him and this is the starting play for you why is this why is this subhanallah we have the haq we have the truth right yet we are the ones that have to justify everything and feel like I need to give you the context. Mm-hmm. What about the way you live, live in your life? You give me the context. How do you decide this? How do you arrive at that? Mm-hmm. You understand? Know, and I think it's important that as Muslims to be armed with their, to be, make it clear, to be armed with the right ideas mm-hmm. and the thoughts because you're going to come in a situation, you're going to come into a, a, a situation like this mm-hmm. when you're going to have to defend your deen. And the thing is, if you don't carry the ideas in the way that they should be, then unfortunately, under the pressure, you might say something that you probably shouldn't do or you might just stay quiet, you know, at the end of the day. But the reality is, is that as Muslims, you know, we are the vanguards of Islam, you understand? And we are the ones that need to protect the the idea and we need to be aware of the idea for that to happen. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's very important because right now, you know what? Like you said, Mudassa, they are going for the juggler vein. And now it's, it's no messing about. It's not about culture. It's not about just a problem with these people. Now it's a problem with Islam. So at the same time, they've got these attacks on a state level. And then they've got the far right attack, which definitely goes back to them. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the far right can say the things they can't openly say. Right, so there's attack from that way. There's an attack from this way. Then you have what happened what happened in, in New Zealand, right? And then what that makes Muslims feel like is, you know, they're, they're, on, the back foot. they're on the back foot. Yeah. They have to justify. We have to justify why a guy came in mm-hmm. and to our, to the mosque and killed fifty Muslims. We have to justify why. You know, there was a video someone shared where there's one Muslim man. And two of his uh, daughters were killed in an attack in America. You might remember this. this, And so it was crazy if you watch this. Mm. 
And the questions that he was being asked. They asked him if you taught your daughters hate. Hate. Yeah, exactly. And his daughters have been killed. His like daughters, he's the victim. And they're treating him, yeah, treating him, yeah. They're treating him and he had to justify his upbringing. Mm-hmm. Why? Because maybe there's something he said which led to the murder of his daughters. Ridiculous. You know, an- another point I'll add to, to what you're saying, uh, and you mentioned some really good points there. Uh, is the fact that on on the one side you've got this attack and uh, the far right's being used and you know the, all of the you know the, the left's being used to attack Islam in their own way and to try and get Muslims to conform. But you know even within our uh, communities within the West, there's certain narratives that are being created that I mentioned earlier on. One of them is you have a group of people that are sort of uh, uh, towards the political left, okay, With, like in terms of uh, <coughs> the Western uh, political parties. And what they're saying is there's nothing wrong with uh, LGBTQ. Uh, there's nothing wrong with... Linda saw, saw uh, mm-hmm. uh, Dahlia, uh, I think Dahlia Mugahid, uh, people like that, you know, that are partaking in the political process and they're actually saying there's nothing wrong with LGBTQ. In fact... Those people are being oppressed and we're being oppressed as well. Mm. So we should back them. And then they're even working backwards to have a look at the verses of the Quran that are talking about uh, the, the nation of Lut. And they're saying, no, this is talking about uh, rape. It's not talking about uh, right, okay. homosexuality. Mm. On the flip side, you have other people, uh, good brothers like uh, uh, Brother Daniel, even though I can't pronounce his second name properly. Hakikachu. Uh, Hakikachu. Okay. People like that who have no bad intent, but they're almost reacting to this leftist sentiment within uh, the Muslims within the West, uh, specifically within America. So then they're coming from the angle, yeah, anything that's happening is good. You know, Anything that's basically opposing the opposite trend is good. But none of them are actually looking at the issue holistically. So they're, they're both looking at a part of the issue and they're basically uh, each trying to defend their own sort of side. And this can be dangerous for Muslims, especially if they have a lot of sway over Muslims. Mm. And they have uh, you know, some sort of uh, political influence over them uh, in terms of the fact that they're viewed as leaders uh, within uh, the community. There's certainly Muslims. influences in society. Aren't There's it? certainly influences. Yeah. And each direction this can pull the Muslims towards is actually, you know, pulling them towards uh, a position that's really fundamentally not Islamic. It's, it's not the, from the methodology of the Prophet. Okay, that actually leads me to uh, a question I have. Because we've spoken about the response from the West. And, and as Buddha Madassa said, in fact, in reality, um, it's, it's obvious this was, was going to happen. I, there's going to be in fact if they never re- reacted in this way then you would think that's that's, that's a bit odd right so we understand this and, and as Muslims we have to appreciate that you know there is a war in Islam going on and you know there's no there's no place on, on any fence you know as, as George Bush said it, you're with us or against us but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that a very long time ago right but my next question then is as Muslims should we see this as a positive that you know as an islamic country you know um, or muslim country i'll say it wants to it wishes to implement the islamic laws as muslims should we see this as a positive then because it sort of leads on to what you're saying as well so i would throw that question out can i just add, i think it's related to just what brother Mugasa said a minute ago yeah that. i think we need to find a balance because to say there's no positive would I think would be incorrect because there is a positive in that the reaction from the people firstly the bil- the fact that they can even outright say we're going to implement it and there not be a revolt means that people are accepting of these laws being implemented to an extent at least the fact that also there's been a lot of people going credit where credit's due we don't want these ills in our society so implementing the sharia of Allah what better way is there to try and get rid of some of these so to say there's no positive would be incorrect in my opinion. So there's definite positives okay. um, in terms of the reaction from people, yeah, the reaction from Muslims. 
However, to outright say just because we have some, like you were saying, some elements of Islam creeping through or getting some elements of the hudud or some elements of sharia being implemented, that we should be satisfied with that or we should see that purely as you know, a step in the right direction. I think that's a bit problematic. That's what I would say, first of all. Okay. You know, uh, in my opinion, I, I, would, I wouldn't have a look at it from the... Positive or negative kind? No. Mm, I, I, my measure of what's taking place is, uh, is, it, is, is that a reality that Islam commits? Now, I completely understand Rash's point about the reaction of the people. Okay, but, but that reaction of the people is positive to me, but it's no more positive than the leader of the CHP trying to pretend he's Islamic, just to appease the sentiments of the people. So, so that's yeah, the CHP is a yeah. secular, yeah. ultra sort of Kamalist secular political party in Turkey. Mm. But you know, so so that positive, obviously, I, I recognize that, and and that's uh, that's uh, that that's something that's been imposed by the Ummah, by her sentiment and her sort of gravitation towards Islam. But I think one of the things we have to be careful about is acknowledging. Uh, the positive sentiment and reaction of the Ummah or in terms of the emotions that she carries for Islam and legitimizing the reality on the ground there. There has to be a very clear differentiation between those two things. Uh, or otherwise, uh, it can almost be uh, viewed as legitimizing the political entity or the status quo on the ground. And that leads to a whole host of other problems. And, and actually, if you think about it, you know, um, obviously the Sultan is beginning a lot of, uh, you know, credit from Muslims' point of view. But in reality, if you look at Saudi Arabia as an example, they've been implementing these rules for a very long time, but you actually won't find too many people who have something to, other than nationalistic people who have something anything good to say about the Saudi family. So so we can see that it's not just about those rules because, you know, this is a, a matter where, okay, you might say it's better, but the reality is, is that we see that the Khudud punishments, mm -hmm. i.e. these are uh, an outcome of the correct Islamic system being implemented in its entirety. And if you look at the, the, the message of Muhammad Sallam, when he was in Mecca and he was uh, performing his dawah there, you know, he never tried to patch up or try to better the Qurayshi system, right? Um, what he actually worked for was a radical transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that involved actually destroying the system, the prevailing system at the time, and then to build upon this. Mm -hmm. And we can see this, that even when the Quraysh offered him position and offered him, you know, uh, a, a power sharing type of uh, offer. We see that uh, he rejected this because, you know, the methodology that he was uh, following uh, was one which was of no compromise. Um, so if we look at, yes, we can see positives, but I think the point that Buddha Mudas is making is that, you know, maybe it's not a, maybe this question shouldn't be answered in an emotional way. It should be answered based on the Quran and the Sunnah, and the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, even uh, Zia al Haq in uh, Pakistan, when he was uh, the ruler there, he started to implement the uh, chopping of the hand. Okay, that never made Pakistan any better. And in fact, there came a time when they just backtracked, and that rule was uh, was removed. So I think it's important that as as Muslims we have to understand that it's not just an issue of one rule or the other. Islam is something which has to be implemented in its entirety because Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran that this book is an explanation for everything. Mm -hmm. So if we say that it's, it's the Quran is our constitution and then Allah clearly says this book is an explanation for everything, how can we pick certain elements mm -hmm. but then other elements, whether it's through the economy or whether other social norms, or social rules, they are abided by maybe a, a cultural uh, come from a cultural angle and do not come from the, the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, this whole idea of 
the implementation of the hudud, uh, number one is, is, is fairly theoretical because of the, even, even in the countries that have apparently adopted it, uh, one, because of the fact that it's very, very stringent, the conditions attached to them. Uh, so I don't say that makes the ruling theoretical, the ruling's still real. But the second thing, which does make it, you know, almost uh, impossible to implement some of these rulings is the international pressure uh, to, uh, that, that the countries can receive. Uh, Saudi Arabia in the past, even Pakistan, uh, when there's been a law or statute in place, like the one for blasphemy or uh, you know, one for uh, uh, adultery, when they have received international pressure, they have buckled a lot of the time. So although the rule is supposed to be there and is supposed to be existing mm. in some of these constitutions, it's not always implemented. Uh, so it is quite theoretical uh, in that sense. Uh, the, the other thing I'll mention is, like, where does this end? Like, okay, uh, uh, a minister in Pakistan got shot by his security guard from Taz Gadri because he was trying to go against the blasphemy law. Like, you know, this, this sort of... Uh, almost just feel good factor like what does it actually achieve and where does it end because a lot of these things will happen in muslim countries where either individuals or organizations will do something that uh, emotionally when you look at it you think wow you know because they're trying to do something to preserve the honor of the prophet or uh, to, to preserve islam but what does it actually mean most of the problems within the muslim world they're not social because uh, the, the social system is probably one of the only systems, remnants of which are still intact in a lot of the Muslim world. You know, if you actually have a look at a, a lot of the, the Islamic world, uh, the social system overall, although there's been attacks from NGOs and whatnot, and, you know, there's abortion clinics that are set up and, you know, they offer free birth control and stuff. That is one of the things that still the family structure is still fairly intact. The majority of the problems within the Muslim world are linked to foreign policy and economy. And if you have a look at all of these countries that are apparently supposed to be implementing the hudud, uh, the economy is based upon uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, the foreign policy is based upon subservience. So what, why are these guys adopting rules that uh, A, it's very difficult for them to implement anyway due to the conditions attached to them, B, when there's international pressure, they probably won't implement them, even if the conditions have been met. And C, it's going to cause a massive uh, outcry and it's going to try to paint Islam in a certain light without the rest of the system being implemented. So if you want to take that sort of piecemeal and gradual approach, which I disagree with from an ideological perspective, from a perspective of you know looking at the actions of the Prophet, but if you're even going to take that approach and you want to combat the tyranny, you know, but you want to do it piecemeal, bit by bit, why aren't you doing anything on the foreign front? Why are you not uh, uh, removing uh, the banking system? You know, if, if you really want to uh, be a hero for the Muslims, then, then go ahead and do that, you know. And that will gain, gain you a lot more support and credibility, and it's going to definitely going to be more meaningful to the people on the ground. Because they're the real issues that are impacting them. You know, there's a saying of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, that from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to his time, he said, no one has been stoned to death for adultery except through admitting the crown. Admission, so. And then uh, uh, Shaykh uh, Uthaymeen or Bin Baz, one of the Salafi scholars, they said that from that time, from Ibn Taymiyyah's time till now, again, no one's been stoned to death based upon just witness testimony. Mm. It's always been something that they've admitted, which shows the, the high burden of proof. Okay? Yeah, 100%, 100%. So why are these uh, rules, uh, why are these governments even adopting them? I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing. I'm just asking a question. What's really going on? Because, like you said, I mean, um, the, there are other things which would need to be changed. I mean, if, if we're talking about an economic system, which is based on riba, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if you look at the, the verses of the Quran that talk about, you know, the people who deal with the riba is like they wage war against Allah and his messenger. Subhanallah, this is heavy, you know, um, in regards to trying to change the situation uh, based on Islam um, and your relationships with foreign, foreign nations, you know, what's that based on? Is that based on Islam? 
Because the thing is, is you know, if you have a secular society, and what you have is you have certain rules which are Islamic, they will never fit. And a for a, a they will look like contradictory for a start, and secondly, the because of the the the, the, the crime and stuff we see in just say in the Western world, uh, these rules would be you know implemented so much it'd be unbelievable it didn't match so that's why when when somebody is dealing with all these things and some people may even accuse uh i'm not saying this but you know some reports i've read where uh the western media is saying look this this the sultani uh tries to show himself as being uh, humble and uh very you know islamic and stuff like this but his own lifestyle is very lavish okay that's what they're saying anyway right so i think it's very important that from a muslim point from an islamic point of view that we understand that when we use an example, we use the example not of the Sultan, we use the example of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Allah SWT tells us in the Quran that He is the best of examples. You understand? And maybe it's come to a stage when you know uh, Muslims are yearning for the the Sharia so much that if somebody is implementing something, people are championing this. Uh, so this is a good sign. What would be a bad sign if the Muslims turned around and said, what's he doing this for, right? They're not doing this. They're actually saying, you know, good done, good job, well done. But what we have to understand is that the reality is, is it does raise a big question mark in the sense that, you know, it's just the penal code that's being targeted. And that's something which really is the one thing that you're giving ammunition to your enemies because they will always use this to say that Islam is backwards, Islam is barbaric, um, and that's one thing which is it's a good question, it's a good it's a good point. That is that is a bit of an odd one because the backlash is that for the West it's a PR stunt. A couple of points. I think these are part, probably the two crucial things we need to tackle. Really, yep. one is that you know when we talk about implementing the entirety of the Sharia, I think like both of you have mentioned that. Point in time. Sometimes people s- listen to that and say, that's why you, you're not giving credit to someone trying to implement some of it. But the issue is, you know, this concept that implementing the entirety of the Sharia, what people incorrectly view that as is that you're expecting some saint to drop out of the sky who's going to implement the deen perfectly. And this is incorrect, this viewpoint, because what would, no one's ever said that the, the human being who's going to be the person who leads is going to implement the Sharia so perfectly that everything's going to be rosy. So that's not the case. I think what happens is just because we're saying that actually Islam needs to be comprehensively implemented, there's a reason we mentioned that. We mentioned that, which is the second part of the point is, we mentioned that because each of the systems of Islam, they're interlinked. They're connected in the same way as some of the hadood punishments are linked with that social system that you're referring to. There's a social system that governs people's relationships, men and women. It yeah. governs that. As soon as you remove that social system that governs how a man and a woman can interact in society, but then you implement the hadood that punishes them for be going astray. It's like injustice. It's, just, it's injustice because you're saying, here you go, I'm going to let you have all the tools to do the ill and then I'm going to punish you for doing it. It doesn't work. This is not how Islam works. And this is just within one system. But actually, even the separate systems, they're intertwined. The economic system is intertwined with the social system. Yeah, of course. Because, you know, if you're not providing for your people, it, then, you know, how can you go around chopping off hands and all of these things if you're not providing for your people properly? You see, when we say the comprehensive implementation of the Sharia, we're saying that all of the systems are linked. You have to implement all of them for you to then say, now I can implement the Hadood. Because you can't do it without that. You know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the Islamic system is the perfect system. Mm for imperfect human beings. When Islam is implemented, and when it has been implemented in the past, there has not been a utopia. We need to keep this in mind. Mm. You know, one of the scholars said that the purpose of the implementation of the Islamic systems is facilitating society to get Jannah. This is the purpose of the Islamic system. It's attaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's uh, for the Muslims, within the state and within the confines of the state for them to 
basically for that for it to be easier for them to attain Jannah. This is the purpose of the Islamic system, mm. and that's why it has to be implemented in its entirety, like you said. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense because you have rules and laws or punishments in place uh, that have been put in place when the needs of the society have not been catered to actually bring them closer to Allah. You know, so the, the social system hasn't been implemented in the way that it should be. So that's why that's a, a very, very good point. The other point I want to mention, which is linked to what we mentioned earlier on, is uh, universality of law and universality of systems. And history doesn't lie. As a matter of fact, the only ideology in written history that melted four empires into ones within the space of 50 years was the Islamic ideologies. And it was the system revealed by the Creator. So you see uh, the, the Christians within Egypt, uh, the Persians, uh, the Byzantiums uh, mm. within uh, the, the Levant and uh, the, the Bedouin Arabs, they were melted in to one Ummah with one state uh, and uh, one constitution. Uh, so, uh, you know, even if you have a look at it historically, in terms of practical implementation, there's only one ideology and one system that has achieved the universality that the, the current world order and the capitalists are trying to achieve. And that system was the Islamic system. And it was actually implemented and it, it lasted for over a thousand years. And all of the people that it brought in initially through that cultural movement through uh, those uh, movements of scholars and uh, intellectuals that went out with the armed forces and spread Islam, all of those people are Muslim up until this day. Those initial areas that were conquered at the time of the Khulafa Rashidin. So that's something to keep in mind. No, excellent points. Excellent points. So just to sort of bring this to a, a close, I think we've touched uh, on uh, quite a few things. Um, the one thing is that uh, we've sort of highlighted the attack on Islam, um, certainly from an ideological sense, and the attack on the the anything to do with the system of Islam. Because what's important also is, this brother once said, you know, like it's very famous, everyone says, Islam is a way of life, Islam is a way of life. And this brother said to me, he said, you know what, I don't agree with that. I said, why? He goes, because people say Buddhism, Buddhism is a way of life. and this is He goes, Islam is systems of life. And I say, yeah, subhanAllah, actually, you know what? Because Islam provides you systems for life, whether that's the economic system, whether that's the social system, it provides you the you know a, a, a comprehensive thing. So certainly we can see that anything to do with the society, the relationship dealing with other people and the authority, we see that the attack on Islam is, is, is clear. In regards to the issue we spoke about to do with the, the, the Muslims, I think it's important to highlight that, you know, it's not we have to tackle this not from an emotional point of view because from an emotional angle certainly if somebody's trying to implement, implement the laws of Allah SWT, this is a good thing but if we refer back to the Quran and Sunnah and as uh, Brother Mudassa made clear as well that you know uh, we see that Islam has to be implemented in its entirety and as Brother Rash uh, mentioned and really made it very clear as well and subhanAllah is amazing that all the different systems of Islam they are once they're all into once they're all in play together. That's when you see uh, the laws come in, because even the hadood, you know, from what I understand is it's from the from the limit. It means from the limit, yeah. And if you look at the way the Islamic rules are, and the way the 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 the, the state is built on the taqwa, when somebody performs an action which actually is punishable by the hudud we see that they've gone over the limit and 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 not it's not a mistake it's, it's something which could not have just happened as a mistake it's something that's thought out because it's harder to do the action and get caught than not to do it right it's like an enforced transgression it's enforced you yeah. know and it? if you compare it to this society where to do haram and do ill ill things in this society it becomes so easy to all of a sudden start to implement the hudud in that kind of environment you can immediately see that's it's going to be anarchy. It's going to be anarchy, exactly. You'd have pyramids of hands. You'd have pyramids of skulls, really, because, you know, it goes hand in hand. And the amazing point you made, and subhanAllah, I wasn't aware of it, that every case that went to the court to do with adultery, 
was where people actually uh, confessions, confessions. Mm. because mm. they recognized they would all, rather have the punishment in this life rather than the next life and this is why the society has to be made on that thought and the thought that mm. in this life what we live for is for the next life you see that is part of those systems in the same way as in the economic system you have to be willing to give some of your wealth not just because it's a law but also because you recognize you're going to be rewarded for it as well and when you build that into those systems that's what makes a success of it if you cherry pick yes you might get some slightly better implementation of a society but you will never get the perfect way Allah has designed it to be done um, um, and and one of the key points sorry to interject yeah very quickly uh, very very important is the the way that islamic systems function there has to be an authorization from the people to implement that so even if something looks good, if Excellent. some guy is Excellent. just doing it as a vigilante or someone who's still come to power through force, but he just feels like doing something Islamic now, that still makes that appli- the application of that law non-Islamic. Because this is the, the way that communists function. This is the way that the Baathists function. This is what Daesh was doing, enforcing rules. The Islamic system is when a society collectively... They want to attain closeness to Allah. They, they want their path to Jannah to be eased. And they appoint a ruler to implement the Islamic concepts, criteria and convictions over them. These are things that they have already adopted on mass as a society. And then they put the, you know, one can say the referee. Yeah, you know, yeah. To basically, we've all agreed on these laws. Okay, we've all agreed on these rules. We've adopted them. They're ours. Now you implement them on us. So this is why it's unsurprising that in the past there was confessions. It's unsurprising because the people, the society and mass has already adopted that. Okay? Yeah. And they know that even if they think they've got away with it, they haven't really because Allah is going to take into account in the Ahirah. So either they are tried in this court or in the ultimate court. Yes. And, uh, so and, and, and a final point, and subhanAllah, it's like uh, you know, so many points come to mind. But a very, another point I think which is linked to this is the fact that if you look in uh, the Prophet when he established yeah, exactly. the first Islamic state in Medina, we see that this was built on the Aqidah. It was built and the laws came afterwards. And when the laws arrived, never did the uh, Ansar or the Mahajirin ever say, actually, you know what, when we gave you the pledge, we, didn't sign we never pledge. signed up for this. <laughs> You know, you know, we, we, you know, I've got an alcohol addiction. You know, I, I really can't stop this. You know, they just implemented the rule as it came. Uh, why? Because it was linked on the aqidah. And going on to Rasha's point, that if you have a society that wants to live by its whims and desires, you can apply any rules over them. In fact, it will have no impact on them. And what they will do is they will do, unlike here, for example, if people can get away with it, they will do it. You understand? And just to finish off just on some ayats of the Quran. Final point? Very, very quickly then. Very quickly. very quickly. You know, one of the greatest manifestations of the hadith of, in Buhari of actions of our intentions is uh, this understanding of uh, the implementation of Islam, uh, the Islamic authority uh, being uh, built upon the Islamic Aqidah. And the finest example of that is the Ottomans did they adopt the French Penal Code or not? Yes, they did. Okay, which understanding did they adopt it on? They under they adopted it upon the misunderstanding that it's Islamic. So although they made a mistake of adopting it, they built it upon the understanding that they uh, adopted it and it's in line with the Islamic Aqidah. So that system where they misunderstood what the uh, they've misunderstood something to be built upon the Islamic Aqidah, even though it's not. That is an Islamic system because they've made an error because fundamentally they're still tra- trying to link it back to Islam. But another system uh, that builds its ruling on democratic rule and the popular vote, even if they've been implementing hudud. So physically from the apparent, it still looks Islamic. That is non-Islamic. And uh, it's one of the best examples uh, to give of the hadith of actions are built upon intentions. Yeah. Okay. To In regards to the Ottomans, we might differ, inshallah, maybe for another session. Yeah. But the, the ayat I want to uh, end on is uh, in Surah Al-Nisa, verse 65, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, translation of the meaning, but no, by your Lord, they can have no iman 
until they make you, i.e. the Prophet, Messiah, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. And this is very important and to end on the ayat of the Quran because when we're talking about this issue of the Islamic system, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that we need to uh, accept with full submission and have no say on this. And in fact, this is so powerful that it says that you won't even have iman until we make Allah and his messenger the, the judge in all our disputes, whether it's a social problem, whether it's an economic problem, or whether it's an international problem. So inshallah ta'ala, I'll end on this note. And uh, hopefully uh, I pray that uh, the, the listeners have and the viewers also have uh, found this uh, interesting and also beneficial. And inshallah ta'ala, anything good we've said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and any mistakes are purely from us. And inshallah ta'ala, we will see you on the next podcast. Jazakallah khair for listening. As-salamu alaykum.